All right. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> my name is Glory Praveen, and I am the project manager for the NAPCARE program. I am coming to you from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil Waututh peoples. It is a real honor to be situated on these beautiful lands and where spring is really starting to make her voice heard. I would like to thank Nick and Catrell from the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association for their support in developing and hosting this we webinar. SHPCA has been instrumental in supporting the NAVCARE program over the last few years, to, um, for which I'm really grateful. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and shared with you, as will the slides. I am so pleased to be moderating this session on volunteer boundaries. We know that boundaries are not always clear and volunteers and volunteer coordinators can be faced with dilemmas in which they're just not sure of what to do. And volunteer coordinators have a responsibility to help volunteers navigate such situations, giving them tools to help make decisions that are in the best interest of clients, families, and the volunteers themselves. This webinar is structured in two parts. Carolyn Parks will first give a presentation on boundaries and following this we'll have a panel discussion where th three panelists will dis present a case study, first giving um, details about the dilemma and then discussing how the uh, issue was resolved. You are most welcome to take part in the discussion. During Carolyn's presentation, please use the Q&A function for posing questions and comments, and we'll address those at the end of her presentation. During the panel discussion, please use the um, chat function, which allows for a bit more interactivity, and I'll be monitoring both and bringing the questions and comments to the presenters. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you find this webinar, webinar info, informative and useful. And Carolyn, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really happy and grateful for this opportunity to come and uh, do a little bit of a presentation today and also to, um, yeah, just be part of this discussion on a really, really important topic. So I'm going to start sharing my screen right away. Okay, okay. Yes. So the title for today is Hospice, Hospice Volunteers and Boundaries, Navigating Ethics, Nuance and Trust. Um, and I just want to say that the, the presentation material, the content that I'm presenting today is um, primarily drawn from the curriculum from Hospice Palliative Care Ontario or HPCO for short. So this is the organization that we at our hospice, so I'm in Peterborough, Ontario, which is um, just about an hour or so northeast of Toronto, for those who don't know. Um, but we belong to HPCO, they're the body that we are accredited by. And so much of the, the um, information that I'm presenting today is drawn from their curriculum and their guidance in terms of supporting volunteers. Um, before I start, though, I actually want to also share um, a land acknowledgement from our area. So we respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territory of the Mishisei and Chippewa nations covered by Treaty 20 of the Williams Treaties. There are seven First Nations included in this treaty. They are Curb Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Beausoleil, Georgina Island, Rama, and Scugog Island. We offer our gratitude to the original peoples of this region for their care, for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land, offer self-reflection with a lens of reconciliation, recognizing that I have growth and learning to participate in while benefiting from this land. Okay. My screen should be shifting forward here. Just one second. Hmm. Okay, we'll do it that way. Okay, so this first slide is a fence. It's a snow fence or a sand fence, depending. We sometimes, when I present this in volunteer training, we choose either based on the season, whatever we're wishing for. Um, 
But regardless of whether it's a snow or a sand fence, we can see it as um, a bit of a boundary. So when I talk to volunteers, I'll ask them um, to describe the fence, to describe the image and describe what they can see and how they think that that might relate to uh, volunteer boundaries at hospice. So the kinds of things that they often say are that it's, um, it's clear that it's there, they can see the fence, um, it, it delineates one space from the other, but also um, the, the boards, for example, are broadly spaced. And so there's the opportunity for things to flow through the fence. There's, there's sand or snow, air can all flow through the fence. And we use this to talk a little bit about the analogy of how um, boundaries aren't as clear all the time as um, sometimes we might wish they were, or it might be easier if they were. So as we go along today, I think we'll be able to talk a little bit more about uh, the nuance of volunteer boundaries, but just in recognizing that this is kind of the way the fence is built. So I support volunteers with the idea that if you're feeling challenged in terms of boundaries, um, if there's grains of sand going through the fence, it's not because you're doing it wrong. It's, it's the nature of the fence. It's the nature of um, volunteering for hospice. And I would say um, any type of interpersonal volunteering where you're, where you're developing long-term and often intimate connections with people that you're going to question at times where your boundaries lie. So that's, that's the image of the fence. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was gonna come in like this. My, uh, my forward function is being a little funny right now. I'll go this way, okay. okay. So um, just in terms of a little bit of an understanding of boundaries, generally speaking, and I think probably everybody has this sort of sense of boundaries as being um, definitely being dynamic and changing and different depending on the situation or context that we're in. They're also going to be dependent upon an individual's comfort level. So um, different volunteers in this example will definitely perhaps have different ideas about where their own boundaries lie. Um, and as we talked about in the previous slide, they may or may not be clearly defined, which is what makes it tricky. And often they are unspoken. So I think helping in um, sort of understanding the, having a little bit of a better understanding of boundaries and how they might be understood is easier if you, we can break it down into a couple of different types of boundaries. So looking at role or organizational boundaries, these are the ones that are a lot of the times um, a bit easier because they should be uh, typically clearly defined by the policies and procedures of an organization. So. Uh, really, as long as our volunteers have an understanding of the expectations and the policies that our, our organization has, then they're a little bit easier to manage. They tend to be less nuanced, I would say, than um, relationship or emotional boundaries, which definitely are not always clear, or, you know, they need to be redefined at times. So I think all of us um, probably involved in this webinar have a sense of why boundaries are so important. They, they absolutely offer protection to um, not only our clients and families, but the volunteer and our organization. And I would really say that they're, they're foundational um, to fostering the trust that we, that we want to foster within our communities. Sorry, I'm not... <laughs> my slides don't want to forward, so I have to pop up everything. Sorry, with my little tab button. Um, so yeah, so fostering trust, they are they are exemplifying the respect that we are offering our clients of all of the experiences they are having. They make things more clear, less confusing, which make it much safer and much easier for our volunteers to carry out their roles and to engage in them in a way that feels good for them. And um, also that we feel confident in um, how they are representing our organization out in the community.
So these I added specifically for today's presentation, just to look a little bit at um, some of the different ways that as coordinators in hospice organizations, we should be um, supporting our volunteers as they begin. And um, when you think about the training and onboarding process that the volunteers dedicate their time to, they really need to have a confidence in, um, I think, our awareness of how important boundaries are and that we are going to be there to support them in terms of any challenges that they might encounter. Um, so in terms of the first point with ongoing access to relevant organizational policies and procedures, I'm sure definitely different organizations would do this differently. Here at our hospice, we uh, provide all volunteers that are going to be, that are, are client volunteers with a volunteer handbook that uh, summarizes all of the relevant policies and procedures relating to really their role in any respect. So they have that handbook with them at all times. And of course they know that we have a very large book of policies if they wanna come in and read them word for word, um, but they always have access to the summarized version. And if they have any questions, they can ask us about that. It's also best practice um, to have a job description for each of the volunteer roles that they might become involved in. And that way, you know, um, from the get go that you both have an understanding of what the what the limitations of the role are and what they should be aiming to focus on. Definitely, if we're talking about home and community support, which um, almost all hospice organizations have to some degree, um, having a clear understanding of how clients and, and volunteers are matched, how they're assigned and how those matches are supportive, supported is really important for volunteers to have an understanding of. And also understanding the communication, the lines of communication, the processes, what a volunteer should do um, if they have a concern regarding their client, who should, who should they speak to, um, all of that is really important. Okay, uh, so as well, continuing from the previous slide, so having the volunteers have an awareness of any relevant expectations regarding um, reporting or tracking of their visits, um, making sure that they have a very solid and comfortable understanding of what kinds of ongoing support your organization can offer them. Um, and, you know, we, in supporting our volunteers here, we, we have opportunities on a monthly basis that are formal, but we always also really stress that informal support is available whenever the volunteer needs it. And although myself and um, one other colleague specifically work in the volunteer services department supporting volunteers, our volunteers know as well that they can really connect with any member of the team if there's, um, if there's a concern that they are having. And as well, of course, how to raise issues and concerns and to whom. So I thought we'd just highlight confidentiality for a minute, just because, um, again, it's one of those just um, key boundary issues that um, without a good focused understanding of the importance of, we know that um, having poor confidentiality is going to undermine our programs um, and it's gonna undermine the relationships that we are working to foster with our clients and between our clients and our volunteers. So. As this slide says, it's really where the rubber meets the road. So um, yeah, I thought, you know, today when we're having further discussion later on in the webinar, we'll probably be identifying some of these um, issues in, in the discussion process. Um, but really, I think that in terms of confidentiality, yeah, just highlighting how, how fundamental it is to everything we provide if we wanna be providing um, ethical support to our hospice clients. And here are some other important uh, role boundaries in hospice volunteering. So again, role boundaries are the ones that your organization is going to have policies and procedures around. And so um, they're, they're going to tend to have a little bit of an easier um, time to be managed if a challenge does come up. A few of them like um, 
physical contact I'm thinking is one that might be a little bit more gray, um, but still one I would say that comes up frequently enough that it's good to have an idea of how you would anticipate that your volunteers would be responding. Um, we can talk about that more again if anybody has any questions. Okay, so this, um, this I think is um, a really helpful and important slide. I've actually borrowed this completely from Hospice Palliative Care Ontario training. Um, and what it does is it describes the difference between a friendship um, and a friendly relationship. So a social friendship relationship versus a friendly or volunteer helping or therapeutic relationship. And these are things I think that come up quite regularly when we start to talk about rather than um, the role boundaries, but rather the relationship or the emotional boundaries. So if we're looking at the distinction, I think it's worth taking a minute to actually look through this slide as a group, noticing that there are some distinct differences in a lot of key areas. So rather than um, in a friendship where there's a history to the relationship, in a client volunteer relationship, it's a new relationship. And rather than mutual support being expected as in a friendship, when you're there um, on behalf of a hospice organization, the volunteer knows that they are there to support the client and the family. So it's, it's, not, about, it's not about us, it's not about the volunteer, it's about the support that we can offer. Um, in a friendship, you're looking to the future together, um, whereas you know in a volunteer match or connection that that relationship will end um, in some way, but that will be based on the needs of the client and um, the organization. In a social relationship also, the relationship has some balance, but in um, a volunteer client relationship, there is a natural imbalance. And I think this is a really critical one to highlight because if we are not, um, as volunteers and volunteer coordinators, aware of this natural power imbalance, I think that um, it's just so critical to be sensitive to that, to knowing, for example, when a volunteer goes into a client's home for the first time or even ongoing, they're coming with, uh, a, I was gonna say a great deal, but um, the needed amount of personal information about that person and their family and their situation, you're walking into a situation where the person has no idea really about who you are, um, so respecting that there's a natural imbalance there and that we are, again, sort of the, the holders and the responsible party in protecting that relationship and that um, connection, I think is really, really critical. Um, in a friendship, the visit happens when you each want. In a volunteer relationship, of course, the visits are intended to happen um, according to an agreed upon schedule that suits um, both, but especially in accordance with the client's needs. And I know that in my work, um, matching volunteers with clients in the community, that's a big part of it, is knowing what timing for a visit would be helpful for the client and then finding a volunteer that can meet that, um, that requirement or that support need. Um, in a friendship, each decide how they should behave. Whereas in the volunteer relationship, in this example, much of the interaction is governed by hospice policy. And I love the fact that I can't see the bottom here. Just one sec, here we go. Um, and gift giving is the last one. So gift giving often happens in a friendship, whereas in um, a volunteer relationship, gift giving or receiving is definitely going to be governed by hospice policy. So I think those kinds of distinctions are really helpful for volunteers, especially from the beginning. Um, they're helpful, I think, also to go to be able to refer back to as the relationships develop and deepen, because I think that what sometimes can seem simple when we first connect with someone becomes a little more nuanced the more we get to know them and the more that the rapport and the connection develops. No, nothing wants to move. Here we go. So this slide, actually, I'm not going to highlight it just in watching the time. It'll be part of the slide deck, but just some nice um, hospice volunteer rule reminders in regards to 
you know, really looking at the idea of being versus doing. And at Hospice Peterborough, we really um, try to adhere to the philosophy of a companioning model where we recognize that we're walking alongside um, our clients and their families, but that they are the directors. Um, so in terms of who's responsible for communicating boundaries, I would say that it's all members of the hospice team beginning from the very first visit. And definitely I think it's the um, responsibility of a volunteer coordinator to make sure that clients and their families have a good understanding of the limitations of the volunteer role before their first visit. Um, but then I would say that it, it really does fall on our volunteers to reinforce these uh, boundaries and the limitations of their role really with each and every visit that they provide to their client, which, which isn't easy. Um, it's not easy. And um, also as the relationships develop. But um, when I talk in training to the volunteers, I put it really plainly to say that the responsibility for boundaries with you, between you and your client is not a 50-50 split. It's primarily your responsibility um, because it is definitely harder for the client to keep track of the relationship being friendly versus a friendship, I think. Um, this slide I think is really helpful to be able to communicate to volunteers. This also was borrowed directly from HPCO's curriculum. So helping volunteers to have healthy boundaries by knowing how to define them, knowing how to comfortably communicate them, which can be tricky. So it's a really good thing to practice with your volunteers if you have meetings or during trainings to have the ability to self-reflect. So to ask themselves if they're not sure, you know, what the implications of a, a client's request might be, for example, um, knowing for sure that they're going to be supported in contacting you as the coordinator, should they have any questions, and then really trying to build the importance of wellness and self-care uh, into your volunteer program so that they're coming with their best, with their best selves. So just about finished, but um, I think just in saying that we really don't want hospice volunteering to feel like a heavy load, um, to feel exhausting and to feel draining for our volunteers. So that's where I think I would just say that I feel like it's our responsibility as coordinators to help hospice volunteering feel more like this. Do good, feel good. So to be able to foster um, a supportive environment, I think, within our programs to be able to allow volunteers to know that if they have um, a concern or they're feeling challenged with their boundaries, that they're going to be um, they're going to be respected. There's going to be a non-judgmental exploration of that issue, and that together you can come to um, some sort of understanding about what the best course of action would be. And I really think that those two things contribute so directly to not only volunteer wellness, but also to the retention of volunteers if we're looking at keeping volunteers in our programs. So I think that is it. That's that's my last slide. And uh, thank you. I tried to go through it in a timely way so we would have enough time for questions and then the second part of the webinar. Um, but I look forward to any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Carolyn. What an illuminating uh, presentation. And I really appreciate um, that distinction between friendship and friendly visits, because a lot, I think a lot of things kind of do stem from, from, from that uh, distinction. And um, I, that slide was just so powerful. Um, so we have a few minutes for uh, um, discussion and uh, questions. And we do have one question in the Q&A. And that's from Katie and she's wondering how volunteers have access to your policies and procedures. Do they just get a printed copy in house or um, how do you go about that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have um, taken the time to create a volunteer handbook that is um, distributed to each volunteer when they become um, onboarded. And so it doesn't outline you know, the policy number and all the like fine details and take a page each. Um, but it's a few pages within the handbook that just highlights uh, the different areas of the policy, the general expectations around the policy, and then um, 
yeah, I think we just let them know that if they wanted to look more in depth at the full policy, that they're always welcome to come to hospice and check out our giant policy binder. But we do try to make it easy by giving them a document. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, if anybody was interested, we would definitely be willing to share what our handbook looks like if it would help other other programs. Lovely, thank you. Um, another comment uh, from Holly. She says, excellent presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, would you be willing to share your volunteer handbook? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we would. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I do have a, uh, um, a question um, for you that came up um, when I pulled the NAVCARE volunteer leads, some of the NAVCARE volunteer leads about what are their top five boundary uh, questions and um, some of them were were around like driving or should we share, can we share our phone numbers or can we pick up uh, um, uh, run errands or pick up items for clients um, and uh, but one of them that was not a very common uh, uh, issue was when a question that was posed of uh, about what do you do when you as a volunteer encounter a client being talked about or discussed socially by others, um, other people that you are with, and they don't know that you are involved as a volunteer with this client. So how do you negotiate that kind of situation? Because that's a little bit different than what you've kind of described mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, I welcome thoughts from the panelists, other panelists as well. As do I, but I definitely know that within um, our community, for example, it's a mixed rural and urban community, but a lot of people, um, there's a lot of connections and a lot of people know one another. So it's absolutely um, not unlikely that a scenario like that might occur. Um, really, I guess that my guidance to our volunteers would be to really just try to use their best judgment to maintain the confidentiality of the client. So not to express during that interaction that you know them because of hospice and really sort of protect that relationship and that piece of confidentiality um, to remain respectful at all times, not to be drawn in. I'm not sure. I'm interested to hear what the other panelists also think about this, because it definitely can be a tricky one. Uh, I agree with you, Carolyn. I think uh, I think that you you have to trust your volunteers to do the best that they can in a situation that may come up um, where, you know, they're they don't they're not able to say uh, that they are volunteering, but that they want to keep the confidentiality of the person. I do want to bring up, uh, however, that if there is also a scenario where somebody or others are talking about a, a client of someone's, that they shouldn't be afraid if, if in that circumstance people know that they are volunteering. So, for example, with other volunteers in the organization or other staff members, they shouldn't be afraid to say, this is confidential and I can't talk about it. So yeah. I just wanted to bring that up as well. So just to, to be, to be, to be sure to, it's okay to say that if it's, if it's in a good, uh, a good situation where you're not breaking the confidentiality of a person or uh, with other people that you're, that you're volunteering for that to point. So. Yeah. If I, if I can comment just once more based on what Cynthia said, I think that that's the scenario that more often comes up because our communities are so connected at times that volunteers might actually get a direct inquiry to say, oh, I know that you, I know this person is connected with hospice. And so actually like looking for information. So we coach our volunteers really clearly to just remind people that it's not your, their story to tell. Um, and that if they're looking for any information, they need to um, call, contact the family directly that you really are not in, you're not able to share any information. So, yeah. So, um, Anna, do you want to weigh in on this? I would say the same, actually, okay. and I have the same problem that I'm working in very small communities and everybody knows everything. And and really, the only way to really get yourself out of a situation where you've been asked directly is to just to straight up say, I'm sorry, but I have a confidentiality agreement and I can't say anything. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and often they also know the clients. So invite them. If you want information, talk to them directly. Mm, good point. Yeah. Um, I, I just, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, because Anna brought up, and I know both of you are in uh, communities where it's more likely that people would know each other. I'm in Montreal where it's more unlikely that people would know each other because it's a big community. However, it did happen personally to me, and I just want to share this. One of my very best friends recommended someone in her building to our NAVCARE program. Mm -hmm. And she was a perfect candidate, this woman who was in her late 80s, and she became a client. And my friend assumed that I would tell her what was happening. And on the first call where she asked, I had to tell her, I'm sorry, but from now going forward, this, this, this discussion does not happen anymore. So, and she was fine with that, but it's just to remind ourselves, even with good friends and even in a big community, sometimes those things can happen. So for sure. All right. We have two more questions in the, in the chat, and then we'll pivot to the panel discussion. So a uh, question from Robert, role definition and policies help a lot in drawing boundaries. Building trust may require divulging personal experience. What advice do you have for volunteers? How much, how far? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I personally love the NAVCARE self-disclosure sandwich for anyone who's familiar with that. So talking about the idea that definitely um, a limited amount of, of connection in terms of divulging information about yourself is really helpful in building some rapport and addressing that issue of the imbalance of, you know, you know so much about them and they know so little about you. So what we really guide volunteers to do is to do it with awareness and to do it with the intention of fostering the, the trust and the rapport within that relationship. So just offering enough information, you know, do you have do you have children? Oh yeah, I do. I have two. Um, but not to go on about, you know, your your kid got in trouble at school yesterday and their report card was bad and all those things. So really just offering some limited information in a way that helps to foster that connection with your client and form some connections, but without it ever becoming about you or your issues or your uh, background. And then often with the self-disclosure sandwich, you're, you're thanking them for the inquiry. So you're kind of acknowledging that they've asked you a question. You're providing a little bit of information and then you're using the bottom bun of the sandwich to sort of turn it back to them and to involve them back into the conversation and uh, use, use their inquiry as a basis to find out more about them. Yeah, lovely. All right, we'll go to the next question. Um, how do you handle discussions about death at home, made pain and pain medications when clients ask you a direct question about what is happening? Hmm. That's a tricky one. Well, I'm not specifically in that role. So I don't know how well I personally can answer. I could try to answer sort of on behalf of um, volunteers, but volunteers would never have that responsibility for sharing any of those types of information as well. So we have you know, other people involved in our organization that would be more responsible for having those kinds of conversations. I think we guide our volunteers to take the client's lead. So if it's a topic that the client has brought up, um, then we encourage them to just follow the client's lead, to listen, to try to ask maybe some open-ended questions to get a better understanding. And then, you know, to know when they might have gained some information from that interaction that they should be sharing back with hospice. Mm -hmm. That's what comes to my mind around that question. I think I think that's well said, Carolyn. And I think, too, that, um, you know, uh, it's OK to say to a client, I'm not really sure, but I can I can I can help I can get that information for you. Uh, but I think that when you do say that, it's very important, exactly what you said, to make sure that um, the client is bringing up these these discussions and the information they are sharing. We we do a training on difficult discussions and how to bring up um, difficult discussions, even with family members and clients as well. 
Uh, but these discussions are supported by our monthly uh, volunteer support meetings, and they, they can be very delicate. So exactly that, um, just uh, making sure that the, the, the volunteers' opinions or perceptions or anything is not put into that situation or that conversation and, you know, getting information later that they can, they can bring to the family and client if that's the case. In our case, um, we do have uh, resources on the Health Authority website that we direct people to if they're asking questions specifically about MAID or medications. Um, uh, but we do also have a policy of not sharing our own personal opinions mm -hmm. about MAID, for instance, but definitely allowing the client the opportunity to explore their own feelings around that. Because I think that it's a really important opportunity for a client to discuss with someone who's neutral um, and to really be able to process their um, their own feelings around it and maybe um, explore a little bit more freely with someone who is neutral. Mm. Yeah, it's great answers. Thank you so much. Um, I just uh, uh, we're going to pivot over to the panel discussion now, and uh, um, just a reminder for everyone: rather than using the Q and A um, function, use the chat function instead. Um, this allows uh, easier interaction amongst each other. So if you know somebody poses a comment, other people in the audience can also respond to that. Um, so. Uh, um, so each panelist will spend a few minutes explaining explaining a situation, and I've asked people to prepare really tricky situations, and they, uh, you know, have really come up with some brilliant, um, thought provoking situations. So uh, they'll explain the situation and then have a, a pause um, in the middle of it to engage with the chat, and then conclude the case study with how they've resolved the situation. And so um, hopefully. Uh, we're a little bit uh, running a little bit over time, but I think we're going to be okay. Um, so uh, our first panelist, Anna, presents a scenario that highlights such a tricky situation when um, care providers are asking for volunteers to support clients whose care needs go way beyond the scope of a volunteer role. And Anna, before you begin, can you just give us a little bit of context about your organization and where you're situated? Sure. Um, so I am a volunteer coordinator, a NAVCARE volunteer coordinator, specifically for West in the uh, West Kootenays of British Columbia, which is South Central British Columbia, in a really quite isolated area between several mountain ranges, and we're we're kind of the middle valley between several, so it's ferries, and we're very rural, um, and also a relatively poor communities in this valley. Um, my territory is the entire Sokam Valley, which is like 120 kilometers long, um, with a string of little villages um, and made up of draft dodgers, dukabors, and hippies. So that, if that gives you a demographic. Um, have, because of our rural nature, we have had a, a real problem with maintaining health services in this area. So um, often my struggle is with the medical system asking me to fill in gaps for lack of services where they should be. Um, and that is a problem because um, on the one hand, I'm trying to support clients who desperately need help. But when the the need is much greater than I can fill. Um, I feel sometimes like I'm enabling the health authority to renege on their responsibilities, frankly. So um, I have this client for a bit. Um, I have never given her uh, a full-time volunteer because she's very challenging and because I know that she frequently tries to cross boundaries and the situation is a bit tricky anyway. So I, I experienced this particular scenario myself. Um, I've been with her 
for a while, a year about. She She's living in rather extreme poverty. She has no plumbing except a toilet. Um, so Anna, I think you froze. Which is another reason why I haven't given her a volunteer. Anna, oh, um, you, 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 fro I froze. you froze for a little, uh, for a few seconds there. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I'm living rurally, so my internet's not very great. <laughs> um, anyway, so she is living in rather extreme poverty and in, in a very uh, difficult home situation. Um, I was originally called because she had her knee and um, was having difficulty weight they felt that having a little bit of support in say accessing medical equipment which I got her a walker and a cane and a few other things um, but uh, because she once it became colder she couldn't load her wood stove uh, safely with her walker she ended up falling against the stove and cracking some ribs and ended up in emergency so after a short recovery in hospital, the social worker called me to say that they were sending her back home and asked if I could pick up some pain meds and meet the ambulance at her home. And I, I told the social worker about the conditions and the fact that she was going to have a, a difficult time staying warm with only wood heat and, and cracked ribs and a twisted knee and not being able to pick up heavy pieces of wood. But um, unfortunately, the doctor was motivated because we froze again anna um reluctantly we did i break again. yeah oh, darn, sorry Just before the doc the, the, the doctor was motivated to <laughs> The, to send her home because they really needed the, the space and the bed and she wanted to go home and was considered competent mm. so I had to so she was going home regardless of whether I helped or not um, so I agreed that I would um, pick up her medication um, because she needed pillars and there was no pharmacy in her community she also had no food and no money to buy food so I contacted the food bank and asked if I could purchase some food for her on their account. And then once I hung up, uh, the physiotherapist called me and asked me if I could pick up some more of medical equipment and install a bed rail and a toilet lift and all these other things. At that point, I was like, wow, I feel like this is getting too much. I really should just phone all people back and say no. But I know her and I know she's going to go home regardless. And I I don't know that she will um, get what she needs food or pharmacy wise if I don't help. So I decided to go through with it. Um, on the way to her house to meet the ambulance, I stopped at the pharmacy and found out I also had to pay for her drugs and that there wasn't a likelihood that I wasn't going to be paid back for that. Um, but I picked them up anyway because they were painkillers and she had broken ribs. And I was like, well, I don't know what else to do. Um, did I mention that this is a really complex situation and one really would hope one of my volunteers wouldn't have to go through? Um, so I got to her house. I installed the medical equipment. Um, oh, and I found out when I got there that there was a hot plate that um, one of her had put in the house and turned on to try to warm up the house. Yeah, so I unplugged the hot plate um, and installed the medical equipment and got her fire going. I met the ants. They got her settled in a, a chair, an armchair in front of the wood stove. She had a, a stack of wood within reach that she could potentially load the wood stove with. Um, I went and picked groceries but after the paramedics had gotten um done I asked them to please take a look at her house and acknowledge and perhaps even contact their head people to say that this is not a situation they should be leaving her in um 
he did contact their head office. They had a discussion, but they decided to let her uh, stay anyway. So um, is there any comments or questions um, before I carry on? So that's to the audience, if you have any comments or questions um, thus far for Anna, um, before she uh, uh, tells you how she resolved the situation. Um, I do have one, one question, and I know it's like the, the, um, the situation is uh, so complex that you would never put a, a volunteer within that situation. So I'm curious how, and, and maybe you're going to be answering this as you as you talk about how you resolve this, I'm curious how you might counsel a volunteer to navigate a situation where it is it becomes clear to them that their care needs are a little bit um, more than what a volunteer can can uh, support, and that could be that that these care needs have kind of just grown over time, and then all of a sudden it's like holy smokes, this has just gotten a little bit over too overwhelming. So. Um, I don't see any uh, comments or questions in the chat. So maybe you can pivot to your, your how you resolve the situation. And if, if that um, question that I pose to you can be situated within that too, that would be great. Sure, okay, so. Uh... Oh, we've frozen again. <laughs> oh dear. It usually comes good. <laughs> I can't comment on Anna's behalf, but I can comment just to say that I think the um, awareness of changing needs is so critical when it comes to supporting your volunteers as they support their clients and to um, not only ensure that the whole team is aware that any changing needs get communicated to the volunteer, um, but to the volunteer to remind them that, you know, even though a staff might have been to see this person last week, if the scenario that they find when they get there doesn't match what we've described to them, then a change has happened and we need to know and we need to be updated because I think as, as Anna's situation describes, she would never intentionally send a volunteer into a situation that was that difficult. So I say to the volunteers, you know, if you, um, if you encounter a situation that feels unsafe or uncomfortable, we didn't put you there. Something has changed. So please let us know right away. Mm -hmm. So Anna, how did you resolve your situation? So I did actually ask a volunteer, um, my son, <laughs> because I knew that he was capable to check on her the next morning. Um, and then uh, given that she was still warm and okay, but uh, we were still concerned, I, I contacted the only people who I had permission to contact in that community and asked them to do regular checks on her the following day. The next morning when my son arrived, she was on the floor in front of the stove. Um, the stove was out. There was um, the hot plate was back on and being used as a heater. Clearly, uh, she had been um, taking her medications improperly. She seemed intoxicated. Um, he called me and, and I immediately said, just stay with her. I'm calling 911. So within 36 hours, she was back in hospital. What I did after that was the next time the medical system contacted me to say she was being returned home, um, I contacted the paramedic that I had asked to take pictures, I contacted the community nurse, and, and I requested to be in rounds that day and to speak to the doctor about the situation. And we all together convinced him not to send her back home again. They had to keep her in long or in the hospital until they were able to place her in assisted living. Um, but yeah, it was it was a difficult situation. And I find more and more we are being asked to do too much. And that is a, a regular occurrence. And in that situation, what I do with volunteers is I stay very closely connected to them. And they are doing debriefs almost every time they go and see the client. 
and we are in constant contact um, about um, and and this is not an isolated case I have other people in the valley like this um, and they are off in the middle of nowhere and not close to anybody and often very isolated from their own communities too so I echo uh, what Patty has written in um, uh, the chat that it's such an incredible, di incredibly difficult situation to be in. And uh, like, it must be like such a morally challenging for you uh, and uh, as a coordinator to, to really know that there's so much need with there's no other supports to help this client. So we do need to move on and uh, we are going to uh, uh, next uh, hear from Cynthia, who really is, it's, it's kind of, it's not quite a similar situation, but it's, it's mm -hmm. illuminating the negotiation of boundaries when families have uh, growing expectations. And uh, Cynthia, so I'll, I'll uh, turn it to you. And um, we've got about five minutes here. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, just, kind of keep it within that time. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will keep it as brief as I can. Just to let you know, I am from Montreal. Uh, my community is about 400,000 people in my region west of Montreal in the suburb area. Uh, and we are a residents of palliative care. So we, we have clients or patients who live in our palliative care residence, as well as community outreach programs such as NAPCARE and various others that we do. Um, my scenario that I'm bringing forward is actually not within NAVCARE. It's within another uh, organization I did work in uh, previously, which um, breaks is isolation for seniors living in their home. Not quite as uh, intricate as NAVCARE, but just general companionship. So uh, I'll call her Emily. Emily was the volunteer who was matched with Nellie. Nellie was an 85-year-old woman living on her own. She did have a daughter uh, who was living abroad at the time uh, that we arranged this, uh, this uh, match uh, together. And the daughter was aware that um, we were arranging a match for Emily to visit Nellie on a weekly basis for companionship and to break isolation. Uh, so it started off very well, um, and I would check in with uh, normally on our how our organization worked. We would check in with our volunteers one-on-one -on -one every month. We would also um, ask for um, uh, an update uh, every two weeks. So that's how we were keeping track and keep in mind, this is a companionship relationship um, just for visiting and uh, breaking isolation. So, um, and I would also check in with the client once a month. So this went on for about four months. Everything was going well. Uh, Nellie was very happy with Emily as a volunteer. Uh, they were they were uh, establishing a good, solid relationship. And then uh, about two months uh, uh, after the four months, uh, uh, I was contacted by the daughter, Doris, and she was coming home. And she was going to be living back in Montreal and she was going to be working. And she because she was working full time, she wanted to ensure that this relationship would go on with Emily and Nellie because it was a good relationship. Of course, we said, yes, we wanted that relationship to continue. And they had built a rapport. And, you know, because uh, Doris, uh, the daughter, was, was not as available, she was out a lot, uh, we felt that it was a, it was a good companionship for, for Nellie. So about two months went by, and I noticed that Emily was saying little in her report, and then about two months after, and even when I was checking in, not a lot to say, and then she had called me and said, we need to have a meeting, and when we did meet, we met person to person, um, she, uh, she was very upset and shy to tell me the situation, so we talked about I started off by just going over the whole pro like the whole relationship from beginning, how it started, how it developed in such into such a wonderful relationship between the two of them, and hoping that we could go from there. So she finally opened up and she told me 
that, uh, and uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, Nellie had uh, a hired, personal hired homemaker that came into the house to help her with bathing twice a week, but also to help with her meals. So this woman would prepare her meals. So Emily told me that about two months prior, uh, this lady, this homemaker was no longer coming during the week. She was only coming on Saturdays and Sundays. And that Doris, uh, the daughter, was asking, just starting off once every so often and asking Emily to make the meal for, for uh, Nellie. And then over several weeks, it became more and more and more. And when Nellie, uh, sorry, when Emily tried to explain to Doris that this, you know, very just trying to tell her that she really wasn't supposed to be doing that, Doris uh, would make comments like, well, you know, if 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 you can't do it, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm working very late. I won't be home and Nellie won't be able to have anything to eat. So this was like a guilt trip uh, to the volunteer. Uh, to try and kind of make her feel bad about it. So, of course, Emily being Emily and her love for Nellie, she was starting to do this like three times a week at least. So this was going on for a while before she brought it to my attention. So that that's the scenario where a family member is really interfere, or I shouldn't say interfering, maybe that's not the right word, but in a bad way, in a in a negative way, uh, trying to um, trying to interfere on their own personal behalf for their own their own, I would say, selfish reasons to uh, to um, try and get the uh, volunteer to break those boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, mm -hmm. wasn't easy. It was it was Emily was very upset. So I can imagine. So that's my scenario. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And um, so I, we are uh, um, yeah. running out of time. So uh, uh, um, I'm just looking to see if there's any comments related to, to this, but I, I think that's really interesting. And I, I believe a lot of um, uh, volunteers and volunteer coordinators will uh, feel that this, this situation is really resonant with what um, they encounter. So um how did you, uh, if in, in a couple of sentences, Cynthia, how, mm -hmm. how did you resolve this? Well, <laughs> I will just let you know, the first thing we did is, the first thing I did is contact my volunteer, uh, sorry, my colleague, <laughs> rather, my colleague, and to, uh, to record this situation, because that was really important. We discussed it. The biggest problem, the biggest worry for Emily, the volunteer, was that she didn't want to ruin her relationship with Nellie. Mm -hmm but she she knew it had to be resolved. So her fear was if we spoke to the daughter about this, that it would affect her relationship with Nellie. So that, so we had to play, I'll just be very quick. I know we don't have a lot of time, but we had to play a very delicate role in uh, going and meeting with Doris, the daughter, to explain to her this situation that we've become aware of and the importance of um, this not being able to continue. Um, her first reaction was, well, you know, they were still visiting, right? So they were still visiting and had time together, even though Emily was cooking for her, mm. which I explained is not at all what our organization is there for, and not, not at all what the, the volunteer is there mm. for, taking time away from their companionship. So sticky situation, um, not easy at first. Uh, so what we did actually... Uh, I'll try and be quick, is we arranged a second volunteer to go in with Nellie, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Emily, sorry, uh, just to start visiting with her for a few times to make sure that there was two of them so that her relationship with Nellie would continue, uh, but there would be another volunteer around too, mm -hmm. just to to kind of um, to make sure that that guilt trip and that wouldn't happen. And of course, explaining to the daughter that this cannot continue. So that in in its just briefly, that was the the outcome. But more details. But that was the yeah. outcome. So yeah. So I, I um, Robert uh, wrote wrote in the chat about the scope scope creep is a real issue where families come to rely on volunteers, especially if they can reduce costs elsewhere. And I would probably echo that, Robert, where. Um, where healthcare providers, like for example, in Anna's case, 
come to rely on volunteers and volunteer organizations to start filling those gaps and it does help reduce costs. So that's very, um, very uh, important point there. So um, we are coming to the close of the webinar and I just would like to um, give Carolyn the last, the last words. And Carolyn, and you uh, mentioned in one of the scenarios that you uh, were gonna present on, um, about the fostering of a culture of trust and safety in the organization so that you can foster resilience within the volunteers and within vol volunteers teams. So I wonder if you just wanted to kind of close out the session um, with just a few words about that. Sure. Um, I think it, it, I think highlighting that as as having the safety to be able to communicate is so important. Um, Cynthia's ex example highlighted that volunteers aren't always comfortable sharing what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And it often comes down to the fact that they might think that it's their fault um, or that they're doing it wrong. Um, in that example, it was the family member who was pushing the boundaries, but Emily was you know, trying her best to protect her relationship with her client. And um, so I think what I always try to foster with the volunteers is just that, Boundary challenges will come up, hence the snow fence. Mm -hmm. Don't think if you come up upon a boundary challenge, you're doing it wrong, you're not. And we are here to support you as a team, as a team of fellow volunteers, fellow hospice staff, uh, to explore and get through these challenges uh, together. And hopefully that really helps volunteers to feel comfortable to share the difficult experiences that they may be having. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you all so very, very much for sharing your experiences and your insights about volunteer boundaries. You know, I hope uh, you as an audience have um, some, some takeaways that you can apply to your own situations. Um, and uh, um, th those situations can be illuminated. We're more than happy to have further conversation. Um, I did pop my name in the um, Q&A my um, email because somebody asked for the um, the uh, the self disclosure sandwich um, issue. So um, I will, uh, if you want a copy of that, I will share that with you. And um, so thank you all very much for joining um, to the panelists. Like I am so grateful for the work that you do, and um, and it's just very exciting to see that. Um, the volunteers receive support from such wise women as yourselves. So thank you so much uh, for participating and thank you all to the, uh, the crowd here. And um, I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> all the best. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks a lot.